Dr. Franklin Jennifer began his journey receiving a bachelor's and master's degree in science. He then received his PhD in plant virology from the University of Maryland in 1970. His contributions to society have endowed him many honors and awards, including the Man of the Year Award by the Dallas Historical Society. Before retiring in 2004, Dr. Jennifer served at the University of Texas for over a decade, increasing enrollment more than 61%. At the very end of his tenure, he saw an agreement with Texas Inst Instruments that would bring $300 million to the university, come to fru fruition. He was also the president of Howard University, which he's an alumnus from. Previously, he served as Chancellor of Higher Education in Massachusetts and Vice Chancellor of New Jersey Department of Higher Education, where he enrolled nearly a quarter million students and left excellence as his mark. Dr. Jennifer is a nationally respected educator who has left each university with academic strength due to his innate role of leadership. His publications range from articles in scientific journals on plant viruses to newspaper commentaries. Some of his topics are Afrocentricity, black entrepreneurship, political correctness, the enduring value of predominantly black colleges and universities, and the aftermath of the Rodney King incident. He has served as a professor, a provost, chancellor, president, chief executive of public, private, and statewide institutions. And finally, now as a member of the Board of Trustees at Fairleigh Dickinson University. So with great pleasure, I would like to introduce Dr. Franklin Jennifer. Thank you. She was a little nervous, but she did quite well. I think you all would agree. Uh, first, let me say thank you all for inviting me here. Um, since I retired as president of the University of Texas, uh, I haven't been giving too many speeches. Uh, someone said, are you enjoying retirement, Dr. Jennifer? And I said, thoroughly. <laughs> and they said, what is it like, Dr. Jennifer? I said, it's, do you like Saturdays? They said, yes. I said, well, it's like every day is Saturday. <laughs> the topic I'm going to talk with you today about is the myth of race and social policy. Uh, the reason I selected this topic is because it combines the two themes for this evening. One, we are here to also celebrate African American History Month, and also we're here to take a look at public policy. And what I wanted to do is to see if I could bridge those two concepts with something that was interesting to me. Because if it's not interesting to me, it's not going to be interesting to you for sure. So this is a subject that I have followed for many, many years, and as you will see, have had some personal acquaintance with it. But first, let me just throw out an idea for you to think about. If you were to walk across this campus or walk into any reasonably major city around the country, and I was to ask any one of you to pick out people based on their race, and none of you would have one minute of problem in doing so. You would look at me and say, you're African American. You'd look at someone who's Asian and say, you're Asian or Hispanic or white. And these definitions are a part of our culture and for most Americans are extraordinarily easy to make. If you can't make that decision, you're in real trouble. Also, what you would notice is that if I took you to a zoo and I showed you a group of chimpanzees, from several, you would probably look at the chimpanzee and say, I can't distinguish one from the other. But if I brought people in, you certainly said you could dis distinguish one from the other. Therefore, your conclusion would probably be that chimpanzees are much more similar to one another than people are. But therein lies the fallacy of race. Because see, race as we distinguish it in American culture is based on the way you look, the color of your skin to some degree, but mainly on your bloodline. Race from a scientific perspective is clearly one that most scientists these days say does not exist. Simply the human species has been on this earth too short a period of time for it to evolve into scientific races. And I must say that the word race is a very sloppy term to begin with. But from a scientific perspective, there is no such thing as race in the human species. And that can be seen quite easily, but a lot of people debate it, and it's worth debating. 
And they say that you can determine through scientific analysis where people ancestral homes are. For example, you now can take a Q-tip and rub the tissue of your teeth, of your gum, send it into about 500 different com companies around the, the United States, and they would send you back a report saying you came from France or you came from some European country, you came from Africa, or you came from Asia. And some of them can even bring it down to a smaller class of where you, within the uh, big populations, where your ancestral home is. So say that, that is a product of race because when you go to those ancestral homes, you find that if you go to Africa, people are dark, like myself. If you go to Europe, they're light-skinned. So race must play a significant role. And you must be wrong, Dr. Jennifer, and those who support that kind of an ideology. But when you go to Africa and you look at Africans, and then you go to Scandinavia and you look at white Americans, the whitest as they can get, you see something very interesting. Within the black population, they are very, very, very different people. So I could take any two Africans from Africa, and I could compare them to an African and a Scandinavian, and what you would see is that there's more difference between the two Africans than it is between Africans and Scandinavians. And therein lies the fallacy of race. But we in America put that aside. We still say, well, race does exist. You know, we classify ourselves all the time. When you, someone tries to rob you and the police come and say, what did he look like? You don't say, race doesn't exist, so I can't tell you. You'd be talking about he's a black, short, Asian-looking guy. But in reality, that is a folk way of looking at race and not a scientific way of looking at race. For example, another way you can see how fallacious the argument is, is when you tend to take people and you say, well, in America, how is race based then? Well, race in America is based on what we call bloodlines. If you have one grandparent who happened to be black, no matter how white you may be, you're black. Now, I don't know how many of you know who your grandparents were, but you better take a quick look <laughs> because you might be black or you could be Asian. But in America, bloodline is very important. And what it really means is that if you have a black parent as far back as their grandparents, then you will be described as being black in America. Now, this means, interestingly enough, that a white mother can give birth to a black child if she marries a black man. But a black mother can never give birth to a white child. Isn't that ironic? Based on our crazy way of classifying people. But put that aside for a time. If you look at our president, he has a black father and a white mother. He self-identifies as being African-American, and in the United States, he is an African-American. Or you take Tiger Woods, has a black father and a white mother, and he doesn't know what he is. <laughs> but this is the way race is classified and how crazy it can get if you base it on bloodlines. Some may say, how do we get to this point in time? Well, if you look historically, the first African Americans to arrive in the United States arrived on a slave ship in 1619. And they were not considered slaves or another race. They were considered indentured servants. In other words, in a short period of time, defined by the person who purchased them, they could be free one day. And that situation did arise to freedom for many of these slaves, former, I mean, uh, Africans. And they were able to hold property, and some of them even owned slaves. And they could go to court, and they lived a reasonably good life, considering. But it became economically in the advantage of Americans, especially in the South, to find a cheaper source of labor than indentured servitude. And therein lied the production and the creation of slavery in the United States. But you see, you just can't slave enslave a person. That's difficult for one human being 
to hold another human being in perpetual bound, uh, 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 bounding. But what you can do, you can enslave someone who is not of your same race or someone who is significantly different than you. It's the same thing we do when we go to war. It's very, very difficult for a soldier to go out and shoot another human being. But if you say he's shooting a raghead or a gook or some other terminology that you use to dehumanize that individual, then you feel a little bit less burdened by the thought of I might have to kill that individual. And that is where race got its foundation in America. The use of race to hold people in permanent bondage. So we lived with that. And when I was a youngster growing up, we knew that race was a factor and races were different. We were taught in our biology classes that there were three classes of human beings, black, white, Asian, and Hispanic. And we were also taught in that class that these two, these different classes were different classes of human beings and therefore we can separate them and they don't have to go to school together. Segregation, Jim Crow in America. But soon scientists began to recognize that that was crazy. And public policy makers also began to say that it must be something wrong with the system that we have of racism based on race. And we evolved slowly through civil rights and through scientific means to find a mechanism where we would be able to create people on an equal footing. Now, some say that that in and of itself should have ended everything. But in 1990, the United States engaged in a significant scientific experiment. We went on a venture to discover the makeup of the human genome. The human genome is the DNA in your cells. And the scientific investigation, which was worldwide, was one of the best funded ever, went on for three years, much shorter than anybody even anticipated. And they were able to find all of the codes that made up all of the nucleotides in their sequence that made up your DNA. So now people got interested again in this question called race. There were basically two schools, a majority school, saying it does not exist. The American Anthropological Association saying it does not exist and should never be used and advised the President and Congress not to use it on forms. The discussion was heated, but overwhelmingly most scientists said it doesn't exist. But there continued to be a population of scientists in our country who said that race must exist. It has to exist. Because if it doesn't exist, how can we explain the great differences that we see in our society between the education attainment of African Americans and whites, the health attainments of African Americans and whites, and also violence? How many prisoners in our jails are African American versus how many are white? And they say because of this kind of gap between the performance of these two races, there must be something genetically in the black population that makes them prone to these uh, differences. And therein, my friends, lies the scariest thing that America should be thinking about and dealing with. Public policy makers should be all over this. But if you ask the president or candidate for office, even looking at the debates over the last few months, you'll notice that the question of race never comes up. I haven't heard anyone say it yet. They use code words, though, the welfare mother, the food stamp president, and a whole host of terminology, which we know as code words for race, and we know what race they're talking about. They're talking about African Americans. But it is important for us today to spend just a few more moments talking about where this becomes even more important. And I can't emphasize how important it is. Because it's a scientific concept, some of us stray away from science and say, well, we don't want to deal with that. But when you begin to see how science begins to impact the lives of all Americans, then you can see why it is a public issue 
and should be debated in a public forum. And that is why I'm so happy to be in this particular public forum today to talk a little bit about it. Let's first talk about the race in medicine. And I know we have at least one physician in the audience who will find this part a little interesting. But again, this is a full semester course and certainly a full several lecture course in most medical schools these days. If you look at the statistics, they show that heart failure is more common among blacks than whites. Symptoms of heart disease developed at an earlier stage in blacks than whites, and that the disease proceeds much faster in blacks than whites. And then you can look at a variety of indicators. I don't care where you draw these indicators. They will all show when you look at health indices that African Americans do more poorly than white Americans do. And now some would say that that's due to social changes or things in our society. They come from poorer environments, maybe many of them, disproportionately poor environments. Education may be poorer. And these lead to these kinds of phenomena. That's what some of us think. But my friends, quietly, but in reality, every day, in thousands of laboratories across this globe, there are scientists, some, who are still trying to make the claim that this difference in our health abilities is due to the fact that we are genetically different, that there is such a thing as race, it resides in both blacks and whites, and that it is the race that makes the medical circumstances so different. And they point to a lot of indicators. One indicator they always point to is sickle cell anemia. That's a black disease, they claim, and that proves it. All black people could have sickle cell and white people don't have it. But that's crazy because all one has to do is to look at the disease itself, to look at the history of this disease and see that sickle cell disease is a good thing if you live in the Mediterranean or if you live in sub-Saharan Africa because what it is, it is a protection against the dreaded disease malaria. When one has sickle cell, the malaria uh, amoeba cannot get into your tissue and cause disease. Because the cell is sickle, it can't get inside the cell. So for people who live in the Mediterranean, sickle cell was an evolutionary change to help them to survive in a very difficult environment. Interesting enough, many whites also have sickle cell, and most people don't know that. But whites who lived along the Mediterranean were also exposed to malaria. And that same mutation that created sickle cell created a circumstance that protected these white Americans. So sickle cell is not a black disease. And if you went into a physician's office and you had certain ailments and you happened to be white and you had sickle cell, he may not treat you for sickle cell because he would think that that's a black disease. And in fact, my friends, there are no such things as black disease. Yes, genetics has something to do with certain propensities for certain things. Because as I said before, you can trace yourself back to your ancestral heritage. You can trace yourself back to Africa or back to Europe. And there may be within your population in those countries that an existence for a particular genetic mutation was helpful. So there may be some differences, but those differences are small, very small. Keep in mind now that the human genome is 90, most of us find that the human genome is 99.9% .9 identical between individuals. So you, the whitest person in this room, and me, I think the blackest person in this room, and don't laugh, Talk, remember we're talking about race today. <laughs> if we looked at our genomes, you couldn't tell one from the other to save your life. In fact, my friends, we're all brothers and sisters. We all come from a common ancestor who lived in Africa 100, 200,000 years ago. And some of her offspring 100,000 years later took off to move in all of the world, all of the locations in the world. But we all have that common ancestor, which some of us refer to as mitochondrial Eve. Now, if you look at the issue, again, we can look at other subjects where race can have a very, very damaging and scary impact. 
For example, some of you may have gone to your doctor, and he may have prescribed a particular drug for you, and that drug may not have worked, and he may try another one, and that may not work. Well, there's a field now called pharmacogenomics in the field of pharmacy and working with genomic scientists, which attempts to find drugs that work with particular populations or individuals. We all don't react to a drug the same way. I went to a dentist about a year ago, had a wisdom tooth that needs to be pulled. And you know, I'd had teeth pulled before. I was kind of cocky. No big deal, Fleeta. Well, I just walk on in there. I'd be home, sweetheart, in an hour. I went and sat in that chair, and he gave me a shot of some potent drug. I assume it was morphine related. That was supposed to not make me have any pain. Well, my friends, I sat in that chair and cried like a baby. I mean, I was sliding down in the chair. I was whining. I was crying. And he was saying, you can't keep that up. I got patients outside. I said, sir, you're killing me. <laughs> I said, try something else. He tried something else. It didn't work. Well, the problem was that this was probably good for a lot of his patients. But for some reason, the particular drug was not a good one for me. And I've learned ever since, when I go to the dentist, give me a triple dose, put me to sleep, hit me in the head, do anything. <laughs> but do not leave me at the mercy of one dose of that drug. Well, scientists have found that drugs do, different people metabolize drugs differently. And some pharmaceutical companies have found, well, is it, could it be based on race? And they have decided, yes, it can be. A drug called Bidel, it's an interesting drug, manufactured, I think, here in New Jersey. And it was a drug approved by the uh, Food and Drug Administration and has all of the particular approvals that it needs. It's out on the market for African Americans. It's not used on white Americans. And it's the first drug ever to be approved for a racial group. Interesting enough, they found that that drug has a good effect on some white Americans also. So again, if you use race clearly as the only criteria for making a decision in the field of pharmacy, uh, pharmacy as you did in the field of medicine, you can deprive some individuals of the use of a drug that may be effective for them. What we need, in effect, is that genes play a role. But to take a race and associate a race with a genetic uh, public issue is a scary thing to do. And in the next area that I want to talk about, you'll see why it is such a scary, scary thing. That those of us in politics, in the decision making, uh, have our eyes closed. It is never talked about, except every now and then you'll see something pop up in the New York Times. And that is the relationship of race to violence. Now, there are some people, social scientists, many of them who are not you who are here, certainly you haven't had anything to do with it, but social scientists, who have noted certain kinds of trends. If you go to prison, most prisoners are black. Hmm. If you look at crime in New Jersey, most crime is committed by Hispanics and blacks. So should police, knowing that, profile blacks and Hispanics primarily because they are the predominant producers of crime, or if you were getting on an elevator one day in a department store or someplace and you were by yourself, dark, some of your senior citizens like myself, you were ready to get on the elevator, and two young African-American men, 18, 15 years old, were standing by the elevator door, and these individuals had hoodies on their heads. They didn't look too well kept. And you're getting ready to get on the elevator. You'd have to ask yourself the question, oh my Lord, what do I do? If I don't get on the elevator, I'm a racist. Because I probably would get on the elevator if they looked like they were white. But I know that black people in this particular community are committing all the crimes. Should I get on that elevator or not? I'd like to ask each of you that question and see what you would say. I know what I would do. I wouldn't get on the elevator. <laughs> But maybe you, being confused and concerned about race, 
would say, I, I get on there no matter what. And then you get your head knocked off and you wonder, what did I do wrong that time? Well, people say you ought to use these kinds of things to racially profile. If you see a black man riding down the road in a Cadillac and he doesn't look like he has a shirt and tie on, stop him, he's probably a drug maker. And a whole host of things that young African Americans have to put up with every day because of their race that white people don't even understand or know. Go into a store. You're standing there for five minutes and you can't wait for looking around trying to find something to get, especially if you're young and somebody will come up to you and say, can I help you? Well, you go help somebody else. I'm still looking. Well, can I help you anyhow? You know, the camera's on. I mean, it is absolutely interesting to look into the black mind one day and see how the things they have to deal with that most of us don't. Well, let me take you to this crime and violence phenomena that I'm so scared about. In 1992, a scientist by the name of David Wasserman he was at the National Institutes of Health. Well, David Wasserman, and I was in Washington, D.C. at the time I was president of Howard University. Well, David Wasserman decided that this issue of crime associated with race had something that we ought to take a look at. He said that no matter what, you, what data you look at, African Americans and Hispanic Americans tend to be highly representative than you would find in white populations when it came to violence. You see, we had always known that there is a genetic factor associated with violence. Some of you didn't know that, but there is. Uh, psychologists, psychiatrists have always knew that there was something. If you look at populations of people who are in prison, you can see that there is usually something that makes them prone to violence that may be genetic in nature that does not exist in normal or regular people. Researchers in North Carolina have recently found that there is an enzyme called monoamine oxidase A. And this enzyme breaks down certain chemicals in the brain that carry information from one cell in the brain to the other cell in the brain. And without this oxidase enzyme that regulates the amount of these so-called neurotransmitters, individuals can become very hyper. So if you have none of this enzyme or it's been mutated, you are very prone to violence. Matter of fact, they found families who do not produce this enzyme into a person they tend to be violent. It doesn't mean that they will actually become violent, but they have the potential for violence if they are put in an inappropriate environment. So if they're put under a lot of stress, they may lose their temper. You probably know some of these people. You know, they seem to be regular and okay, but they get in the store and the line is long and they lose it. Or there may be a police officer, seems like he's okay, but you say something back, he's off to the races. All of us know these kinds of individuals, and we have been able to trace that back to a combination of things that have happened to them and certain genetic mutations that may have occurred in their lives. So Wasserman said, yeah, we know that. So what we need to do is to have a conference at the University of Maryland, and we're going to invite scientists from all over the United States, and we're going to talk about this subject of race and violence. Well, I'm going to tell you. That's a loaded subject matter to want to have at your university. I'll bet you nobody at Fairleigh Dickinson would, would pick that as a subject matter to have on this campus. If you did, you'd have everybody and every politician from here to Montgomery, Alabama, you know, to come in here and try to straighten you out. And that's what happened to Wasserman. He was off to the races. He, everybody thought it was a great idea. We're going to talk about race. We're going to talk about violence. And all of a sudden, all hell broke loose. He was hurt. Wasserman is Jewish. And Wasserman said, wait a minute. If anybody's opposed to race, I am. You know, my grandparents, you know, saw race in Europe. And when Hitler came out and he said that if you have one great grandparent who's Jewish, you're Jewish, no matter how Aryan or you may look. And since you are Jewish, you are not a part of our race, and therefore we can do things to you, and you know what they did to them. 
So he was hurt. Oh, Wasserman was hurt. And he went back to his lab and said, you know, I'm hurt and I'll never do it again. Well, a couple of months later, colleague, Dr. Frederick Goodman, who was also head of the Alcoholism, Drug Abuse, and Mental Health Administration called Adama, is the highest ranking psychiatrist in government whose research focused on neurobiology of aggression made a news conference. He went on news and he said, look, no matter what has happened to Wasserman, this subject matter needs to be discussed. We cannot just be put our head in liberal sand and say that race doesn't exist. Um, and, and what we need to do is if race, if, if African Americans or any other population happen to have a, a genetic mutation that causes them to be more violent, we ought to probably look at it. Well, people didn't pay a lot of attention to that. It went by most people. But then Wasserman kind of, not Wasserman, Goodman, kind of full, full of himself, began to talk about what his research would involve. And he was going to dictate a whole large part of the federal government budget to this, what they call, violence initiative. But he began to talk too much. He went on television and said the violence-prone individual lives in high-packed urban areas. Urban areas? That's code for black folks. At least that's what black people think. And that's what most liberal people think. And if you listen to the debates, you know it's true. Clearly, there are code words, and he was using every one of them. He went on to say, to design and evaluate psychological medical interventions for at-risk children. We know who at-risk children are in urban centers. We're not stupid. They become labeled as delinquents or criminal. And if we can find these individuals, and we purport to take 100,000 of these, 100,000 African Americans probably, some Hispanics, and we will treat them with certain drugs. Now, this is not Frank Jennifer's research or Fairleigh Dickinson or Harvard University. We're talking about the National Institutes of Health. And I must remind you that at that time, the National Institutes of Health was headed by an African American. Lewis Sullivan was Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare. Lewis Sullivan was the founder of Morehouse Medical School. How could Mo Lewis Sullivan, the founder of Morehouse Medical School, a eminent physician, and now holding the highest position of health in the country, how could he be supportive of this kind of work? Well, Lewis Sullivan came out and supported the work and said, look, I am concerned as an African American that when I look around me, there are too many African Americans in jail and they're treated in a criminal fashion. And I think this is more of a public health issue than a criminal issue. So if we can find young people who are prone genetically to become criminals one day if they're not careful, then we can treat them at an early stage. But it was too late for him. By now, activists all over Washington, D.C. were getting involved. And I mean getting involved. On my campus, at Howard, you know, which is in the center of Washington, D.C., there was a lot of interest in this subject matter. They were all saying that this is a massive attempt to say that to African Americans, that to most of them, or to white Americans, that African Americans are prone to violence, something that many people thought anyhow. Well, Lewis Sullivan said, look, I got to do something about this. So what he did, he said, I'll reach out to somebody. I'll reach out to the tall, dark, and handsome president of Howard University. You're supposed to laugh about that. Franklin Jennifer. So I got the phone call from Louis Sullivan. He said, Frank, I said, yes, yes, Louis, how you doing? He said, I need you to help me on something. I said, what is that? He said, I want you to hit up a panel of scientists from all over the country to come to Washington and try to make some sense of this craziness we've gotten ourselves into. Well, I said, I'll think about it. And my friends, I did everything I could to get out of that one. You cannot win in that kind of a debate. But in fact, I did serve. And we did come up with some ideas about what to do in the future. And one of those ideas was when we get involved in this kind of research, 
that involves race, and whether it's health, pharmacology, or what have you, it is important to use scientists from some of those populations to be representatives of the search te research teams. So Howard University was involved, and there's a genomic center now at Howard doing very well. And many other places that are doing research have had to clear certain policy-making boards. Therein lies the result that Lewis had to let people go. He let, uh, not let Wasserman, he, uh, Wasserman still is teaching. He's no longer in the federal government, but he's teaching. Goodman is still serving. Both of them have been tremendously hurt because they did not intend to do anything wrong. They thought they were doing the right thing. But because they're in an unintentional efforts in a very dangerous and sloppy field led to a very dangerous and potential dangerous outcome. Now, I want you to know why I think public policy makers have to get involved and get involved soon. Science is moving at blinding speeds to do all sorts of interesting things. Some scientists like myself at one time in my life, I believe that nobody should tell me. The federal government ought to stay out of my laboratory. Don't tell me what to do as a scientist. But that was before we had discovered the entire makeup of the DNA. That what Harvard University scientists are telling us, in the next 10 years, each of you will probably be able to look at your grandkid or your child and you will be able to see on the child's, right after the child is born, on the crib, the entire genome of that individual. You'll be able to look at that genome and tell whether the kid's going to be smart, tall, dumb, fat, ugly. You'll be able to do everything by looking at that one little tape. Think about what a world this would be if policymakers, and the crazy policymakers sometimes, could get hold of that kind of information. Is that what we want the nation to do? Is that the kind of science we want to be conducted? If not, why not? And if so, how do we control for it? Already, scientists in California have been able to find a gene for strength. And they've been able to take that gene for strength and take it from one mouse and put it into another mouse. And the mouse that they put it into was a little old weak mouse. You come back a few months later, and it looks like a bulldog. Muscles all over the place. And now, how long do you think it's going to take for well, some smart, wealthy person to say, well, that makes some sense. Let me take a gene from a human being and, who's a track star and stick it in my son who can't do anything. And then his son comes out and runs the 100 meters in 9-3. My friends, those are not just crazy thoughts. That's reality. Today in science, we are able to probably, unless except public policy makers did step in and say we couldn't clone humans, but we are capable of cloning humans, or not capable, but are very close to being able to clone humans. We can clone pigs, we can clone uh, cows, we can clone dogs, and they look just like twins. If science was allowed us to look at cloning, we could probably use it in a good way. In other words, what I could do in the early stages, say, I'm getting to be an old man, but when I was young, I cloned some tissue. And now my heart is going bad. All I have to do is go to the warehouse and pull out the heart that I set aside years ago. Well, I got a kidney, kidney, a kidney sitting over there, got eyes sitting over there. Now, how many rich people would find the money to make this happen? And my friends, we are on the verge and can do that. Or well, certainly we'll be able to do it in the short future years. Should us, we as a nation, say that there are certain limits, and policymakers know those limits, and place those limitations on what kind of policy we must have to make this a true nation, and what kind of policy hurts? Well, I'm going to finish now, because I know there's time, and we want to save some time for some questions. But what I want to finish with is this. No matter who you are, you are a homo sapien. 
There are no such things as races in the human population. You are each, whether you like it or not, brothers and sisters, with a common, a common ancestor. You have an ancestral heritage and a cultural heritage of African Americans, Chinese Americans, and Hispanic Americans, and you ought to be proud of that. But when it comes to science and the difference between you and a white person if you're black and things like IQ or things like in uh, medicine or things like drugs, you are the equal to any other human being. And there has never been, and it appears that there never will, be science that associates those two things in a way that can be detrimental. But you must be on your P's and Q's. It has happened before. In our history of America, we have had instances where African Americans have been set aside for unique studies, one many years ago on syphilis, and another on the H, I mean Y and X chromosome, I mean Y, Y, X chromosome that appears to create some level of violence. We need to be careful about the research that's conducted on each of our separate populations, ancestral population, and have that associated with race as a biological phenomenon. I want to thank you all for being such a patient audience and allowing me to get through a very difficult subject matter in hopefully a reasonable period of time. Thank you very much. We want to thank you, Dr. Jennifer, for enlightening us with your knowledge. We're going to start question and answering now, questions and answers now. So how this is going to work, we're going to raise your hand, and we're, I'm going to walk to you. Um, I'm going to start with the first question. My question is, if we didn't have race, what would def the definition of diversity be? I just think when you say the word race, you ought to know what you're talking about. If you're using the term race as a biological phenomenon, uh, in the very key areas that I talked about, that's scary. But it is appropriate, and matter of fact, it's important that we continue to use race in the political context. We need to understand what's happening to different populations of ethnic and racial groups, quotation racial groups in our country, as defined by the blood terminology. We need to know that. So it's important, if we need to know classify people in race and determine how well we're doing in resolving the historical issues of race in our society. If we did away with race, we wouldn't know what was going on in various communities. And that would be a sad thing. So it's, it's, as I said before, the term race is a sloppy term. And one has to be very sophisticated when one hears people using that kind of terminology. And to try to determine what their really, their intentions or meanings really are. And to one, correct them if they're wrong. In other instances, uh, it is appropriate for use. You're familiar with uh, Professor Henry Gates of Harvard and his uh, television program mm -hmm. to do with uh, ethnicity and race. What's your opinion of that, that I, entire episode? Some of you know uh, Gates is a, one of, if not the leading African American studies professor uh, in terms of age. And there are a lot of young people now coming along that are just outstanding. But uh, he's been around a long time. And uh, he's always been a powerful advocate for issues of equity in African American history and the importance of it. And he considered himself an Africanist. But then he thought he'd have his genes tested. So he went, scrubbed his gum, and sent it off to some place. It came back that he had white ancestors. <laughs> well, that was a little bit disturbing for him. Not for him, he found it kind of funny because he's a smart guy. But some of us, and some of you in this room, who probably think you're one race, and I'll tell you, you better not check. <laughs> because often it'll come back, you know, that somewhere along the line, somebody, you know. <laughs> now, wait, this is an adult audience, so I'm not going to get too, too descriptive of what could have happened. But we know it happens. So uh, sometimes you let a dead dog lie. But uh, Henry Gates, he decided he would take a look, and it was an interest. I think it's appropriate. Those of you, after the, um, what was the Roots? Uh, uh, Haley, the book came out. Roots, you remember Roots? Well, every, before Roots, nobody cared about their ancestry. 
Roots came out and ran a series, and the young people don't remember that, but it was the most popular series ever. I mean, everybody was coming to get home to look at Roots. And after Roots was off, everybody wanted to know what my ancestry is. And that was not easy to do until we found techniques, uh, genetical techniques, to be able to trace your history back to your ancestral home. So in Roots, a lot of us, a lot of people, went about making that search for our ancestral home. But the problem is that's your ancestral home. That's not your race, because race doesn't exist. That's your ancestral home that you ought to be proud of. And your ancestral home may have predominantly black people, and that's you should be proud of. Uh, but it'd be just as bad if to try to distinguish blacks from whites and say, those who can dance are black and those who can't keep a beat are white. That wouldn't be nice, would it? And I remember getting on a bus when I was young, riding from an all-black community into uh, another black community, but I had to go through a white community. And I got on the bus, and there was a big sign on the bus that said, if you're white, you're all right. If you're brown, stick around. But if you're black, stand back. And I decided that was not the bus I wanted to ride on today. But isn't that amazing how far we've come? But again, this understanding of race and its implications is important. Yes, any other questions? Hi, uh, thank you very much for coming out. I really enjoyed your speech. Uh, I was just wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on the uh, racial profiling in terms of violence you were talking about. Not in the sense of uh, genetic predisposition one way or the other, but I was thinking, for example, uh, Israel and Palestinians, Israelis profile for Palestinians because they're more likely to blow up bombs in Israel. So what, what would you think about, about that? Well, let's give some credit to Israel in the circumstances Israel happens to find itself. I mean, I have not traveled to Israel, but those who have say you have to really go there to understand why many of the things we may think are appropriate for an Israelite is not important at all, you know. And that is when somebody can take a, a rifle and almost shoot from one country to another or drop a you know, grenade, you know, launch a grenade into your community, you've got to have some way of protecting yourself. So what the Israelis have done in a very scientific way, in many respects, they have put together a whole classification scheme where there are a lot of behaviors. It's not just your race. But it's a lot of behaviors, how you carry yourself, whether you, whether you, what kind of clothes you wear, what kind of tickets you buy for the airplane, you know, how you look walking through the airport. And they can profile probably better than anybody. Matter of fact, most people think we ought to be using more of that at our airports than some of the much more invasive techniques that we currently use. That you can profile people. Profiling is not particularly bad. As I explained to you, profiling in some instances makes some sense. Any human being who's a social human being. If you live in New York City, for example, uh, most New Yorkers know how to profile. They know how to stay out of trouble. They see trouble a long ways away. Oops, I got to go this way. <laughs> they all. People from the suburbs, they can't read those kinds of profiling things. And they go, oh, ha, ha, let's just go down there. Next thing you know, bang, 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 boom, boom, boom. <laughs> profiling is OK, you know, and we do it all the time, you know. But it is inappropriate when you're using profiling to stop somebody on a New Jersey turnpike because they happen to be driving a pretty car and happen to be African American. But to say I'm just opposed to all profiling, that would include the Israelis having a, looking at their unique circumstances, using it as a tool, I would not have an opposition to that, unless it was based solely on the race of the people. Now, if that was the only criteria, then it's wrong. But I don't think that's the criteria that is used. Uh, they use a whole host of other things, and I think those work. Any other questions? Doctor, what's your uh, number one public policy uh, effort or uh, interest? Well, I think the, it's not altered or changed. It is involvement. I think what we need to do is to get young people because I'm an educator, I guess I go back to the youth all the time. Because it's not my world, you know. Actuarially, I don't have but about 10 more years to go. Matter of fact, actuarially for an African-American male, you're only supposed to live till you're 73 years old, or that's the average. I just turned 73, so I'm living on bar time. Every day I walk out the door. <laughs> so I'm a little nervous about all of this. Uh, too long. But I don't have a lot of 
time. So, but it's not my world. You know, my world will be gone in 10 years. But some of you, some youth, are going to have to live in this world for the next 60, 70 years. And what kind of world will they be living in? And what preparation should they be making to ensure that the world they live in and their children grow up in is going to be a world that is free of racism? And you know, so that everybody will be able to perform based on their effort and not on some superficial way. And I think the best way to do that is to ensure that people get a quality education. I think if I had my druthers, I would say one should create a process where no one should be denied of free education because of finance. That if you want to go to school, college, and you can gain admission, Somebody should cover your costs. Now, theoretically, you may say that I don't want to do that, but we, we work with a theory that when people are educated, we all benefit. So when a kid says he wants to go to college, we ought to say that we will benefit from that kid's education, so we ought to pay a part of it. Well, the kid is going to benefit from his education, so he ought to pay another part of it. And then we ought to say, that those who have a need, you know, should be brought up to their level of need with, you know, based on the, uh, the cost of education at any comparable public institution, whether you're... Now, what that would mean for schools, especially in the private sector, is that, and New Jersey was doing it for a while. They had what they called the Independent Aid Act, Independent College Aid Act. Uh, had some name similar to that. When I was vice chancellor, I remember it very clearly. Where regardless of where you went to school, you were given state aid. And the reason for that was that the state benefits from your education, not from where you go. We benefit from citizens who are educated, not from the, the fact that they went to a public school or a private school. We benefited because they went to a school. Therefore, we ought to pay that amount of money to that school, whether it's Fairleigh Dickinson or whether it's Montclair State. And that kind of a philosophy, I think, would tremendously improve the quality of education in schools across the country. Uh, I, when I was chancellor of higher education in the state of Massachusetts, I was over all the public universities in the state of Massachusetts. We put forth a program somewhat like this. It uh, barely saw the light of day. Uh, legislature in Massachusetts killed it pretty quick. But private school lobby was unbelievable. I mean, public school lobby was unbelievable. But again, it's something to think about. But I would say, that, especially to African American kids, it is so important that we see to it that every kid gets an education. Now, every kid cannot be a physician or you know, engineer. And we ought to stop the foolishness of telling kids you can be whatever you want to be. Some kids can't be whatever they want to be, even if they try hard. But there are things that that kid has and talents that that kid has that if we were to invest in those talents, that that kid could bring wonderful benefits to all of us. And our educational system should be geared to make sure those kinds of things happen. And that would be my wish you know, in these last decade of, uh, of my life to see uh, young people, uh, regardless of where they live, being able to get a free college education. Questions? My question is perhaps if you had a suggestion for, um, in this times of polarizing, if someone's different than us, they're quick to throw the term racist. Mm -hmm. And instead of tearing people apart who look different, disagree with us, in the spirit of building bridges, do you have a more positive synonym that we could try when we hear that term racist to, to spread some good cheer or you know, just to sort of dilute that sort of negative polarizing yeah. with that kind of term well, racist? It won't spread any good cheer. And I hope you noticed that we didn't use that word at all in my presentation because I'm sensitive to it. Because if you're going to give a presentation to an audience that is going to be mixed and certainly a large number of whites, the last thing you want to do is turn the audience off because a lot of people here have worked as hard as I have and maybe harder to improve the quality of life for all Americans, black and white alike. So to call a person racist or to say a race is a racist is, you know, easily said, but it's a very dangerous term to throw around and very easy 
term to use to fight against people. But racism does exist. And the reality is that it does exist. But the kind of racism that exists is not just something that perpet is perpetuated by African, I mean, by whites against African Americans or Hispanic Americans or Asian Americans. The kind of racism that exists in our country today is what we call institutional kind of racism. And that kind of racism is often conducted by African Americans. It has no racial designation. People doing the things that they think are right and just inadvertently do something that's wrong. Wasserman and Goodman, good men, good men. Yet they were condemned for being racist because they were doing something they thought was right. To try to head off the criminalization of young African American men in the early stages of their lives, to treat them psychologically and sometimes, and even in small number of cases that they claim, small number of cases with drugs, to make them less violent early on that they would not suffer in our society from illness. And they were called <laughs> worse things than racist. So we have to be careful. You know, we just have to be careful. Uh, I was saying earlier, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to be mean and evil. It's certainly nicer to make the same point, but to make it in a much more acceptable fashion. I, I, I tell you, when people start getting into that sort of gamemanship, uh, I'm quick to, to leave the environment and say, you know, another day, you know. Thanks again for talking to us this afternoon. I have a colleague who's unfortunately not here who does research on torture, essentially. He does not injure anyone. Uh, his his, his uh, research is, is based largely on mathematical models. But as I understand some of what you're talking about today, you're interested in the intersection of uh, the relationship between public policy, politics, and research to some degree. So what I'm wondering is, my colleague has encountered some criticism uh, in the sense that uh, some of his critics say, this is just an area where you should not do research. Uh, you may find results that will give aid and comfort to people who would, uh, who would, who would torture uh, people, who would, who would use uh, force and violence in interrogation. And of course, another side says, uh, well, the nature of inquiry is to, to get uh, results and, and information and, and use that as part of, uh, a part of the debate. So my question to you is, you know, in light of your experience, in light of your academic and professional experiences, uh, I mean, how, do you, how would you steer that and other conversations? What's the right relationship between uh, politics, public policy, and research? Well, but let me just say that that's the theme, hopefully, the reason why I accepted this particular speaking engagement. Because I want to try to make a statement, if I make no other statement, that public policy makers have to be concerned about what is going on in the scientific community to try to ensure what's best for all Americans rather than for some Americans. Now, I don't know how the outcome of that policy will be. And some of us get very nervous when government starts engaging in you know, what we should do and what we should not do in our laboratories. Uh, but I do believe that there is a humane issue to be addressed in this, an ethical question that should be addressed. And I think there are bodies in this country and should be bodies in every research or scientific group of ethicists that can make that determination a lot better than I do. I will only say this, that as, a, as humans worldwide, we made a decision, at least those of us from civilized countries, made a decision that torture uh, would not be used. The United States was late to sign on to that, that torture would not be used. Um, I think that I'm, I, I hear myself, I'm one of the people who believes in that also. Now, on the other hand, until someone comes up with some, you know, for example, I often use the example, if we knew if we captured an individual who had placed a nuclear device in New York City and we captured him, and we knew that that nuclear device was going to go off in about an hour, and it was 
equivalent to Hiroshima bomb. And we knew it. We knew he had that information. We have signed on to a policy saying we don't torture, we won't waterboard you. Do you think we would waterboard that individual or would you stand up on policy and say no, we are America and we have to stand for something, we're gonna let the New York go up into smoke? You probably, the president would probably sign that one in a heartbeat, despite the fact that he has said that he is against torture. Is it something that we ought to know and not use? I don't know. But again, I think it's a question, and I think you raise a very good question for ethicists and public policy makers to think about. The problem is when we get to these kind of difficult questions, like that one, like Israel, like race, there is no public forum to make those kind of discussions. There is no public forum in the United States to talk about the issues of race. We have never sat down as a, as a population of Americans and talked about what I'm talking about today. Never. And you rarely hear this presentation presented. Uh, two years ago, a major corporation in the state of New Jersey invited me to give a talk. And I said, mm, that's interesting. I'll talk about you know, things I'm interested in. I said, I'll talk about race, uh, the mythology of race. They said, well, why don't you send in what you're going to talk about? I sent topic. I said, why don't you give us a little bit more about what you plan to talk about? And I told them some of the things I told you. They said, we really think you're a fantastic scientist, Dr. Jenner, but, but please don't come to our company. <laughs> now think about that. You've heard my presentation. Would it scare you if you were running a major company? It might. It might not, but the issue here is we need to talk about it. And if you are on a campus like this one and you had a researcher doing work that was highly questionable, uh, as long as that research was public and as long as it didn't violate the code of ethics or ethical questions of Fairleigh Dickinson, that individual should be allowed to continue that research until such time as people think he had crossed or she had crossed the line and obviously that is not the case here at Billy Dixon. If there's going to be an error made, you should err for him to be able to do what he wants to do in his laboratory. But there is a line. There is a line that can't be closed. If someone says, can we use cloning, I say no. Uh, you know, and again, there are laboratories across this country that are ready to do that tomorrow morning. But I would say no to that. Now, how do I stop those researchers from doing it? I say you can't get federal research dollars. You can cut them off from state research dollars. You can shut down research in a variety of ways rather than to walk in the laboratory and close the door. But, that's, uh, but again, that's what I'm trying to say today. If there is no other message that you leave here today with, the message I want you to leave here today with is that there is a role for public policymakers in the scientific investigations and science of the future. There is a role. Despite the fact that scientists will go kicking and hollering down the road, there is a role. What is your feeling about the approach that Europe takes in the uh, discussion of uh, A levels, B levels? If, uh, to approve of the occupation, one doesn't necessarily have to get into a school. Uh -huh. The United States has never really understood, at least I think it hasn't, put together a system of higher education. And I think a system of higher education is existence in places like Europe. In the United States, it's pretty much a laissez-faire. And in New Jersey, they used to be, I used to be number two administrator for all of higher education in New Jersey many years ago. And I thought that was good. And the reason it was good, because we could establish a system way of looking at education. We could ask questions, as they have in Europe, is what is best for Europe, not what is best for public schools or public education, but what is best for New Jersey? That was how we asked the question. And when you answer that question, as they have historically answered many, many years ago in Europe, especially in Germany, in that they would establish schools for all of its people. So if a young man wanted to be a plumber, there were quality institutes for him to go to to be a plumber, and there were jobs waiting for that individual. 
The same thing for a variety of skills. I remember uh, people coming to my house to repair the television, and the gentleman came to repair the television. He walked into the house. I knew they were going to charge me a lot of money. He was a young man, not college educated, but technically educated in a technical school. He reached under the television, took out his screwdriver and turned the screw, came back and said, Dr. Jennifer, that's $350. I said, sir, all you did was turn the screw. He said, oh, no, no, no. Turn the screw didn't make any difference. It's knowing what screw to turn. <laughs> it made the difference. So we need to make sure that we have a system of education that meets the needs of all of the citizens, regardless of what their educational potential is. And therein lies community colleges. The community college system, too often now, is trying to become you know, a four-year institution. And four-year institutions are too busy trying to become universities. And universities are too busy trying to become super universities with major research activities all over the place. Everybody is creeping up. And that's because the faculty is pushing. If you're a faculty member, you can graduate from Harvard University and you end up at a community college. The first thing you're going to start talking about, we need to better the quality of the students we admit. And we need to have at least some upper level courses. And then the next thing, if you're at the state college working, well, we need to have more research. What we need is schools that are excellent in the area in which they have been you know, created. An excellent liberal arts university can produce as good a research as some major universities when it has access to graduate students or undergraduate students who are very talented. That can happen, and it does happen in major teaching universities. But those teaching universities want to become PhD universities, which have great laboratories, and nobody's teaching. Uh, I'll tell you, I came from a major research university. Uh, I was president there, and I hired a major Nobel laureate. He's dead, so I can talk about him. I hired him, paid him $300,000 a year. I asked him what was he interested in teaching. He said, oh, well, Dr. Jennifer, I'll teach one graduate course once a year, half a semester. And the rest of the time, I will talk to my students and my colleagues. And plus, Dr. Jennifer, you've got to bring my whole laboratory here with me and 17 members of my laboratory, of course. And I have an extensive travel circumstance where I travel around the world and talk. And you'd have to sign off on that, of course. Uh, but uh, I know you'd be interested in having me because I'll do a great job. I'm trying to figure, great job in what? <laughs> well, every time he signed, he signed a grant, we got it. I don't care who it was. <laughs> he put his name on it. Despite the fact that it was supposed to be meritoriously evaluated, it came back funded. So he pays his way. He paid his way. But would Fairley want to hire him? Is that your mission? Is that the mission of Montclair or Ryder or Seton Hall? So schools need, I think, a system. You need to look at everything. And what are we here for? To improve the quality of education of citizens, to the benefit of all of us. And once you conclude that, then there is a mixture of schools that can provide that education for New Jerseyans. Some will be public, some will be private, and there will be a robust community college system with access to all, regardless of finance. That can be done, but not in a laissez-faire environment where every person for itself and every sector for themselves, fighting and scratching for every nickel, without any philosophical base for how we ought to proceed. That is the problem. Any other questions?